Yeah, I mean, explain. Could you explain the weakness of the left? And you made a really nice synergy. And tell me if I'm interpreting you correctly, but I really liked it because part of the paradox of my critique is that I'm, you know, whether we're calling it wokeness or PMC politics or whatever, there's all these elements and variants of liberalism that just always show up as a problem in terms of, you know, ideological, strategic, just, you know, sort of unappealing culture for building any kind of mass politics, this type of thing. And then on the other hand, it really strikes me, uh, particularly when we look at, you know, various historical examples, like someone like A. Philip Randolph, who I've been, you know, tuning into a lot recently, that, and, and, and even, you know, and, and you pointed out that sort of modern iterations of liberalism and socialism in different contexts are actually very encouraging in the sense that a fair amount of sort of substantive liberals started to recognize that their view of substantive individual rights for all was incompatible with, at the very least, unfettered capitalism. And increasingly socialists, you know, sure, there's this or that debate and, you know, some of them are very worthwhile about the weaponizing of human rights discourse and, th and so on. That's extremely important. But almost none of us would seriously suggest that we're trying to create a political outcome that wouldn't allow for, you know, free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of substantive liberal rights. So there's this kind of interesting convergence, it seems to me, that actually could be politically very appealing, which is socialism and the expansion of the civic and legal, basically rights revolution of the 60s, in contrast with this sort of like constantly proliferating sort of, you know, identitarian sort of micro politics. Anyways, I don't know if I interpreted you correctly, but I'm wondering if that, has something to do with the answer of the potential to, to rethink a better position left right now? Well, uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that socialism is basically a deepening of the promise that liberalism made to people. Socialism is an extension of the liberal philosophical and moral tradition. And we use liberalism in two ways. One is a liberalism that is committed to the defense of property and to the defense of this the order that came up with property, the social order. And that's a liberalism that, of course, that's used in a pejorative and neg negative way and deserves to be. But there's another side to liberalism, which is, as you said, the, the realm of rights. Now, what is socialism other than saying that people have economic rights alongside the political rights? Furthermore, socialists say even the political rights in capitalism are undermined by the massive economic inequalities in the economic system. Because as I, as I said earlier, if politics requires and depends upon the mobilization of material resources, then if those resources are distributed unequally in the economy, it means politics will also be played out in a way where one side always has more power than the other. So the socialists say that is this, every life is as important as the other. It's called the moral equality of, uh, of individuals. But if we want every individual to have equal worth, then they should have an equal ability for flourishing, for acting out on their life plan, for meeting whatever goals they have in life. And that ability cannot be equal if they are in positions of domination and subordination to each other, which capitalism systematically creates. So socialism basically can be thought of as saying, we want to take the promise that liberals made, that Kant made, and that Hegel made, and we want to make it real. Now, the liberalism that you talk about, Michael, when you say there's a lot of liberalism within the left today, I would not call it that. So the identitarian stuff that you talk about, the narrowness, that is not an ideological hangover of liberalism. That is a very, very active set of people pushing their material interests. Right. The left in the United States is fundamentally and overwhelmingly a middle-class formation. It is not a, it's the first left globally, historically, that has no connection to the working class, to the poor at all. People complain that the left is white, bullshit. That's a second, the left 
has those non-whites who are in the American left are all middle class too. It's disproportionately white, but it's all middle class, regardless of its color. In that setting, when you're only bringing in middle class people into your organization, a big chunk of them are gonna say, we don't wanna hear about poverty. We don't wanna hear about the economy. We don't what we wanna know is when we walk into a room, why are we not treated well? When we apply for the, the salaried positions at six figures that we think we have the right to, why do we get 5% less than the other guys? That's what the middle class on the left wants to hear about. It will dress it up in all sorts of historically powerful language and all that. But Adolf Reed has been saying this for a while and it's only because he's in America that people think this is controversial and the rest of the world, what Adolf says is just common sense, which is this is a form of nationalist politics. And all nationalist politics has one or the other class character. Either it's a nationalism that's wrapped around the needs of the poor, or it's a nationalism that's wrapped around the needs of the aspiring emerging elite within the dominant, dominated groups. Identity politics is the class instinct of black, brown, and Asian, yellow, whatever you want to call them people, and the women. It's, it's not an ideological hangover. It is a very committed and clear set of material interests. And as long as the left remains in the middle class, it will never get out of it. Yeah, you know, it snapped together for me, actually, again, reading Adolf Reed. It's another South Africa example of looking at Tavo and Becky's move to the African Renaissance and just seeing like, okay, this makes a lot of sense that as soon as the ANC is not a project of labor and redistribution anymore, then the entire, you know, the only social project that remains, it's not even, I mean, it, it's fundamentally a criticism, but it's literally like the only project that could remain is to build a wealthy African entrepreneur class because there's no other room, there's no other room left. You've handed macroeconomic policy to World Bank IMF. You're not going to bring a wave of obviously primarily black people out of poverty from the apartheid era. Those structures economically are going to remain in place. And, you know, here we go. And again, that, yeah, and that was You're going to dress it up as, as um, black progress. You're right. going to say that this, now look at, look at all the industrialists we have. It's, I mean, if the left were interested in actually learning from history, this is the entire history of the post-independence colonial world. It's aspiring elites taking over the movement, using the language of cultural difference, of racial uplift, uh, all this business to justify the creation of an entrepreneurial class and the hoarding of opportunities by the rising middle class, and then shitting all over the rest of the population and saying, look at us, look how great our achievements are. Right. The US yeah. is no different from that. So what happened? So, I mean, then what's the move? <laughs> how, how does the left become, how does a, a show like this even, I'll make it as petty and trivial as that, but like, how, what, what makes it so that there are thousands of Teamsters watching this or reading right. Jacobin or whatever? You know, what, what is right. the move? Yeah. So I, look, I would say this, Michael, I think where we are right now is in a much, much better place than we were at 10 years ago. That place is this. Make a distinction between advances in the broader culture and advances in organized politics. Okay? What's happened over the past 10 years is because of all the churning and the movements from, black, from Occupy through Black Lives Matter through the Bernie moment, which was really what made it explode, to now. It's been a tremendous revitalization of certain ideas and certain aspirations, which had been killed by the new left, these aging 68ers. They destroyed it, and on the left, and they, of course, behind them was standing the power of the business community. There's been a great now reawakening of certain aspirations. We all deserve better lives, that poverty is real, that the rich don't deserve to take everything, and that whether you're black, brown, or whatever, uh, you have certain things in common if you're on the bottom. That's what your show feeds on. That's what Rising feeds on. That's what the Young Turks and all these people feed on. And that's what this movement right now, this mobilization, is pushing even further forward. But politically and organizationally, there's been almost no, no advance whatsoever. And the, the law, Bernie Sanders' loss, sadly, is, is a big setback. Yeah. It would have been a very big step forward if he, if he could have won. He would have been massively constrained, of course. 
The thing about Sanders is he doesn't lie. He would have told you what the, what the, the, the lay of the land is, and he would have said, we're going to have to fight. What's happened is organizationally we're very weak. The cultural advance right now can go one of two ways. It will either continue over the next five, six, seven years and gain traction, or it will be taken over by the Democratic Party and the foundations the way it always was. If it continues to move forward, then I think out of this culture, something could emerge organizationally. I don't think it'll come from the existing alphabet soup of the left. I don't think it's gonna come out of that. It's too mired in its old ways and its culture and its institutional settings and in its separation from the poor. But it might come out of the poor. And when it does, it will wash away the identitarianism because any left that's based in the poor in America is going to be black and brown. It's not going to be overwhelmingly white. And they're going to look at these black and brown elites and they're going to say, <laughs> um, we really have no need for you. We're not there yet, though. Right. Vivek Chiver, I really, really appreciate your time. I hope you can return often. I'd really recommend everybody read. I'll just hold up one example. You can, there's really no excuse not to read this. Uh, <laughs> these are very readable, very accessible. Uh, and I'd also and you can recommend. download them for free right now on the Jacobin website. So Download them for free on the Jacobin website. You should also watch uh, the Vex Stay at Home series as well. Uh, Vivek Chibber, I really, really appreciate that. This and and um, frankly, just like with Adolf, I appreciate uh, those of you who who have held the flame. Frankly, uh, <laughs> I'll put it like that. Listen, I, I wish I could leave it. You know, it's, it's like Brokeback Mountain. I wish I could leave it. <laughs> <laughs> it. My life would be so much easier, but uh, I'm, I've got too much hatred in me. I think it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> that comes through and how great the writing is. Vivek Chibber, thank you so much. Thanks. And you're doing a, just, it's a really, really important show. And the world would be a much worse place w without this little niche that you guys, you, and these other shows have carved out on YouTube. It's a fundamentally important contribution. So don't get discouraged in any way. Oh, that's a big honor. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Be well. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.